About five years ago, I taught a class called Mastering Rahu and K2. I taught that course about a year after my Rahu maturation. And I learned so much about Rahu during that maturation and year and the following year that I decided to do a course on Rahu and K2 at that time. At the conclusion of that course, I said, I'm probably going to have to teach another course on Rahu and K2 in six more years or so when my K2 matures. So my K2 matured last year, and so um, I am now teaching that class, as I expected I would want to. I learned so much about K2 in the last year and a half that I thought, you know, it's time to do the course. So this course is not meant to replace the old course. Um, the old course, Mastering Rahu and K2, is given astrologer the knowledge they need to use Rahu and K2 in the horoscope, and came with a lot of Rahu and K2 interpretations. Um, that are really useful and handy. This course is Healing Rahu and K2. And we're going to go deeper into the nodes and learn how to actually, how they're impacting our health. And by health, I mean our mental, emotional, physical, and energetic health. Not just the health of our body, but just our health in the context of being a happy entity on Earth. Okay? That they very much impact those things. And that by healing them, um, we can be happier. And in fact, I'd say most of what we're doing down here is trying to heal Rahu and Ketu so that we can be happier people. So Rahu and Ketu are really the critical things in the chart for when it comes to seeing the work that a person really has to do. Okay? Now I have lots of work that we have to do, but most of it's simple work. Even like the work of the Lajitadya Bhashtas are relatively simple because we can consciously work on those. We can, it makes sense. You can hear about how we use your Lajitadya Vastas and you can go, yeah, you're right, that won't work, I'll do it the way that works. It's not a big deal. It can be dealt with with respect, you know, just in a common sense way. But Rahu and Ketu, they go deeper beyond our common sense. And they're the ones that underneath are creating this muckery in our life that causes us to have our real serious problems. Problems that we're so wound up on and so wound up with that we don't even know how to begin, you know, we don't even have the time to deal with the Lajitani of Ashtas. If we are at peace with our Rahu and Ketu, we could work out our Lajitani of Ashtas very easily. It would be obvious of how to, to do them. But because Rahu and Ketu are, are stress, stressing us so much, it's very, very difficult to even begin to proceed with the Lajitadya Vashtas and the work that those require. So the biggest work we really have to do is that of Rahu and Ketu. So as an astrologer, the biggest service you can be to your client is informing them on their Rahu and Ketu and how to heal it. In other Rahu and Ketu courses, I haven't really dealt a lot with the actual healing of them. Okay. In this course, it's all going to be about the healing. So any redundancy in this course from the old course will have some redundancy perhaps, yet for sure, but then a whole other um, insight about Rahu and K2, which is the, um, the method of healing that particular nodal problem or Rahu and K2 problem. Okay? So it's going to be all about healing these. Now what are we healing though? We're healing disease. Disease is the lack of freedom. Okay, that's my definition of disease. It's the lack of freedom. When the body is diseased, we can't use our body. We're not free to use our body to do what we want with it. Okay, that's physical disease. If we have emotional disease, we can't feel happy about the things in our life that we want to be happy about. Okay, so if I have a disease in my leg, that it causes me pain, that I can't, say, go on a run. So I don't have the freedom to go on a run if I want to. Okay. Now, if I didn't want to go on a run, it wouldn't be a disease. It would just be a bum leg. Okay. So, because it wouldn't affect the freedom. Okay. Same for the emotional disease. For emotional disease, someone might want to be with someone and want to be happy with that person, but emotionally, they're unable to be happy with that person. So they go to counseling, they break up, they get back together, 
You know, they basically have your modern day relationship, which is impregnated with emotional disease. And so they don't have the freedom to love and be happy with the people they want. They don't have the free emotional freedom to feel, find happiness and fulfillment with the other things they have in their life. Other people, other things, whatever it may be. And that's the biggest, really in this day and age, that's the biggest disease that we're dealing with. Okay? Then mental disease is the ability to use our minds, or excuse me, mental freedom is the ability to use our minds to create what we want to create. To use our minds creatively to better our own lives and the lives of others and the lives of everybody in the world. Creatively. Anything that impairs that is a disease of the mind. Okay? So those are the definitions we'll be using in this course. Then there's also an energetic disease. So, consciously we want to use our body, right? And if we can't use it the way we consciously want to, it's a disease. Consciously we want to have emotional happiness and we want to love certain things and we want to have fulfillment with certain things. And when we're able to do so, we're emotionally healthy. And if we're unable to do so, we're emotionally diseased. Consciously we want to use our minds to do certain things. If we're able to do those things, we're mentally healthy. If we're unable to do those things, we're mentally diseased. Now, on an energetic level, we do not consciously want to do anything. Our energetic body is constantly reacting to the world around us. So, if you're driving your car, and you're consciously, your intention is to go to, you know, the mall, and you're driving your car to the mall, that's your conscious intention, okay? You have the physical ability to get there, you're in your car and you're driving it. You have the emotional ability to get there, or, you know, meaning, you know, you have the emotional ability to be happy when you get there, if you're emotionally healthy. When you get there, you'll actually be glad you're there, instead of getting there and be all grumpy. And mentally, you're going there for a reason. You know, you have a purpose to go into the store that you want to fulfill, that helps fulfill the purpose of your life and the life of others, so you're going to the mall. So you can be healthy on all those levels. But as you're going to the mall, a, a semi-truck comes out of nowhere and heads right towards your car. At that point, this is nothing conscious. There's no time for conscious activity. You have to respond right away in the right way to not get smushed by that semi. It's your emotional body that reacts and responds and takes over at that point. That instinctive energy. Your body's just going to do something. Does it do the thing that keeps you alive? Or does it do the wrong thing? Okay? And an energetically healthy person, their body does the right thing to keep them alive. Okay? They'll turn the wheel the right way, just hard enough. They hit the brakes just hard enough to be safe but not cause another problem. Okay? Most accidents that happen are caused by overreactions or underreactions. One person might just freeze and not do anything. Another person might smash the brakes on too hard and cause another problem. So overreacting, underreacting, instinctively, that's when we have an energetic disease. We might do that physically when there's a physical threat. We might do that with a person. A person might just show up and drop something on us and we, we, want, we want, or might want to respond and react with understanding, but instead we feel it as an irritation and we get angry and bothered by that person and we feel bad about it half an hour later. We didn't react instinctive, instinctively the way we wanted to. We reacted instinctively in a way that hurt us or hurt others. So, on a, when a person's got disease on an energetic level, they'll instinctively respond and react to things in a way that causes them more problems. More problems physically, more problems emotionally, or more problems mentally, okay? And cause them to have more diseases on the other levels, okay? So you can see how disease is a very complex thing, and that for that reason it's very hard to escape it. And the thing that makes it hard to escape is Rahu and Ketu though, okay? Rahu and Ketu are the contributing factors to disease. Any planet can be in a disease state, but the stress that creates that disease state is the day-to-day -day stress we experience on account of Rahu and Ketu. By removing that stress, our body, or all of our other diseases will melt away. The diseases of other planets will melt away. So on one level of astrology, we can predict and we can say, oh, 
you've got Saturn and the Sun in Aries, therefore you've got a heart problem. Okay. That's because that's going to show an uh, imbalance of energy in the heart meridian, and that's going to lead to some heart disorder. But the reason a heart disorder is going to manifest as a limiting factor in your life, something that prevents you from doing what you want to do, is because of all the strain of Rahu and Ketu. So when it comes to healing a person, if we can heal the Rahu and Ketu, we've already healed the rest of the problems. Okay? We don't have to treat every planet separately. We just have to heal this bottom line stress that's ripping all the other planets apart. We all have strong plants, weak plants, strong organs, weak organs, okay? But, um, you know, we all have those things, okay? But that doesn't mean they need to be sick, exactly. That doesn't mean they need to be diseased. They're diseased because of the strain that's put upon our entire being. Uh, and, uh, and that strain comes from Rahu and Ketu. And that's what we're going to talk about in this course. Okay? So first of all, what is a node? Well, node is the cornerstone of astrology. In fact, you can say astrology is about the planets and the nodes. Because there's so many kinds of nodes in astrology. The famous nodes are Rahu and Ketu. Rahu is the north node of the moon. Ketu is the south node of the moon. But there's more nodes than that in astrology. So what is a node? A node is when you have a circle of something, and you have a, another circle, okay? And where, um, where the two points intersect between those circles, that's a node, okay? So we have the path of the sun around the earth, and the path of the moon around the earth, apparently around the earth. So from our point of view on earth, it looks like the sun's moving around us. From our point of view on Earth, it looks like the moon is revolving around us. And it actually is. The sun, of course, is not, but it looks like it. So we have these two circles, and their intersecting points are the north and south nodes of the moon. Rahu and Ketu. But those only aren't the only circles up there in the sky. The most important circle is the circle of the sun around the Earth, apparently around the Earth. That's the zodiac circle. Okay? But, and I'll talk about that circle in a moment. But we have other circles. We have the circle of the horizon. We've got the eastern horizon. And we've got this whole horizon, horizontal plane. The east and the west, north and south of the horizon. And where that plane intersects the um, ecliptic, the ecliptic plane, the zodiacal plane, we have on the east side, we have the lagna. And on the west side, we have the seventh house. So the Lagna and seventh are actually, their exact, their exact degree, their exact place on the zodiac are actually nodes. They're nodes of the horizon. And out of the nodes of the horizon, we create the twelve houses, which is three times four. The houses are three modalities, movable, fixed, and dual, and four elements. So, 3 times 4 is 12, okay? Then we have, oh, and the Lagna and 7, they move in the forward direction through the Zodiac. And the houses move forward. So, the first house goes from Aries to Taurus to Gemini to Cancer and so on, right? Okay, then we have Rahu and Ketu, okay? They're the nodes of the moon. The nodes of the moon are interested in that they move reverse to the zodiac. They go from Aries to Pisces to Aquarius. They move backwards. They move backwards. Okay? And they don't rule signs of the zodiac, um, although some astrologers try to make them rule signs of the zodiac, which I consider a huge mistake. They don't rule signs of the zodiac, but they do rule nakshatras. They each rule three nakshatras, just like all the other planets do. The nakshatras are a three times nine division, and there's 27 of those. Okay? Another node we have is the zodiac. I'll put that down here. The zodiac is we take the equatorial plane, 
the circle of the equator and extend it into space until it intersects the zodiac. And where it intersects the zodiac is Aries and, and Libra. Okay? The vernal, or the spring and vernal equinoxes. Got it? Okay. And that, there's 12 zodiac signs. That's also a 3 times 4. There's four types of houses. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha, or we Dharma we can say um, having to do with your own nature, self houses, Artha, which are your material well-being houses, Kama, which is the fulfillment of your desires houses, and Moksha, which is freedom from worldly suffering houses. Okay? Those are four types of houses, and each of those houses comes in a different flavor. It comes as an angle. Um, which is also called an angle in Western astrology, a panapra, which is called a, um, oh, in Western astrology, remember what they call them. I think they're called succeeding houses, or cadence. I can't remember my Western terminology for this second and third type of houses. But in Vedic astrology, angles are 1, 4, 7, and 10. Then we have the panapras, which are 2, 5, 8, and 11. And then we have the apoclemas, which are 3, 6, 9, and 12. I cannot remember the Western names for those anymore. Um, it's been a long time. But we have 3 times 4 types of houses, too. Then we have another node. We have the node that creates the nakshatras. I'll abbreviate that. And that's the node of the galactic equator, where it intersects the ecliptic. Okay? That moves backwards, oh sorry, this moves forward, this moves backwards, and is, gives the nakshatras, and that's 3 times 9 again. So it's interesting how it works out. We have one type that moves forward, which creates 3 times 4, which is 12, and then another type, which moves, the nodes move backwards, which creates a 3 times 9, which has to do with the nakshatras. So we have a, these two divisions. So there's a lot of interest in philosophy if you study this. That's not what we're going to do right now, though. That's not what this course is about. In this course, we're going to talk about how Rahu and K2 influence houses, how Rahu and K2 influence the zodiacs as well. And this first course, there's actually going to be two parts on Rahu and K2. Um, so I have a part A and a part B. And the first part, it's going to be Rahu and houses and signs. Or actually, it'll be Rahu and signs, then Rahu and houses. So we're going to deal with the three by four divisions, okay? And then we're going to have a course on Rahu and Ketu in the nakshatras, and that'll be the second part of this course, okay? The reason I'm doing it this way because we're dealing with Rahu and Ketu in very different ways um, when we're dealing with it in houses and signs versus when we're dealing with it. Um, with nakshatras. What is, what's actually existing, is the houses and the signs. The concrete existing things are the houses and signs. Your responses to them, your experiences of those things, those have to do with the nakshatras more. Okay? The first thing that happens is there's an existing something. And then the second thing is, is that creates an experience for you. So first Rashis, then Nakshatras. That's why when it comes to doing like predictive work with astrology, it's best to start with Jaimini or Tajika system and then go to the Parashar system, which is the Nakshatra based system. The more Nakshatra based system, okay? Um, but start with the Jaimini, which is the Rashi based system for your predictions. Because that gives the concrete. And then there's the reaction and response to that. But then it's a circle. Out of the reaction and response, we become programmed to react in response to, and respond to certain things. So there'll be a concrete reality, and we'll respond and react to it based on our past concrete realities, not necessarily the, the concrete reality in front of us. So for instance, if, ever, if you were a really weird looking kid that nobody liked because you also had a major personality disorder, and any time a girl came up to you, it was to pick on you or say something mean, because you grew up in a cruel American high school in the 80s or something. Then, 
anytime a girl walks up to you, you're immediately going to start having a negative reaction to that possibility. Okay? Now, if your concrete experiences were all negative, you're going to become programmed to think that your concrete experiences in the future will be negative too. And so you're going to set yourself up for them to be negative. You're going to re react in a way that ensures the next concrete experience is going to be negative. But maybe it's really not a negative experience. Maybe the next concrete re reality could be good, but you're acting in a way that it turns out to be bad. So it becomes a bad concrete experience. So it's a cycle, it's a circle, it's like a chicken and the egg thing. What came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, you can't figure it out. What came first, the concrete experience or your negative reaction to a con or your reaction to the concrete experience? And then because of reacting to concrete experiences before they even come, having expectations, we create concrete experiences that, you know, mirror and maintain your, the concrete terrible experiences you've already had. So it's very complicated. So we're going to start with the concrete experience part though, which is the, the Rashis and the houses. The reason I'm starting with that, the main reason is because in astrology the sun comes first and then the moon comes second. But in life on earth, we can't say the sun is more important than the moon, right? In India, in fact, they pay more attention to the moon than they do to the sun. In the West, they pay more attention to the sun. Two different cultures decided to give more attention to different planets. Both planets are equally important, and the reason we know they are equally important, because when the moon is on the horizon, it's the same size as when the sun is on the horizon. So since visually they are actually the same size, although the moon gets waxes and wanes, they are the same size visually in the sky, because of that, we have to treat them as equals. And any culture that doesn't treat them as equals falls into decline. Okay, because you can't emphasize just one part of yourself. The sun is your male side, the moon is your female side. If you emphasize just the male qualities of a culture, you get sick. If you, the culture deteriorates and gets sick. If you emphasize only the female qualities of a culture, the culture gets sick too. Just like in individuals, we have to maintain the health of our male and female sides, and um, for all people everywhere. So, um, but we're going to start with the sun, because astrologically the sun is the first planet, which means we're going to start with the Rahu and Ketu and the signs and houses. Okay? Now, um, the main theme again is healing Rahu and Ketu. So the remainder of this first class, I'm going to talk about some postulates. I have 12 of them for healing Rahu and Ketu. And you need to like read these and understand them. This is the process by which our misery comes about. Okay? And this is the process that um, Rahu and Ketu interrupt. Okay? So life, postulate number one, life wants to live and to create. That's what life wants to do. It wants to live and it wants to create. It's vital. And that is the principle of the sun. It wants to exist. It wants to shine. Okay? And that, you know, shining of the sun, that desire of life to create and to live, that can be eclipsed by K2 especially. Rahu and K2 eclipse the sun and the moon, right? When you have an eclipse, the sun or moon disappears because of Rahu or Ketu up in the sky eclipsing them. Okay? So, life wants to live and create. As long as life is living and creating, we'll be happy, disease-free people. Okay? But Rahu and Ketu eclipse that life and can cause problems with the disease. So, suppression of life is disease. Or what we can say is that the eclipse of life is disease. The eclipse of living and of you know life living and life creating, the stalling of that, the suppression of that is basically what disease is, and that's indicated by Rahu and Ketu. So suppressing life in others is to start the disease process in others. So. When you suppress life in someone else, you don't let someone live and be and expand and create what they are. The minute you start suppressing that, you're starting disease in that person. 
Everyone's disease is started by the suppression of a, what they see as a more powerful force, which is the parents. In our early life, the most powerful force is parents. Because when we're a few days old, a few years old, we don't have a concept of God and creation. It's just mom and dad as these powerful entities. Any suppression from those parents starts the theme of disease. It's the concrete thing that starts that theme of disease. Okay? The suppression of life that causes disease. However, we're already born suppressed. We're not born perfect. Okay? That's why when we're born our horoscopes suck. It's not like they're perfect when we were born and then three months later they change and they suck, right? We're born with all of our imperfections. And we're born into a family where our parents suppress the parts of us which we've already suppressed. So we can't blame the parents. The parents are a trigger to our own experiences. Okay? So a suppression of life is disease. Suppressing life in others is to start the pro disease process in others. Then while releasing life in others starts the healing process. So as an astrologer, the minute you start talking about a person in the context of their chart, what they really are, without suppression, this is what you really are. You're healing them. They're becoming healed right away. I remember one person um, they, were, they came in like this. They literally came in like this, you know. And it was a woman. She came in like this. And I looked at her chart. One of the first things I said in five minutes, I said, Oh, I'm sorry to see that you had an abortion, you know, two years ago. And she just, the minute I said that, she went like this. And opened up and got more pink. She came in pale like this. She literally was like cramped like this. She had all this pain. Cramped. The minute I said that, opened up, the healing process started. Because what did I say? Life was going to have abortion in her. That was what life was going to do. Life was not going to fulfill the birth of a child. It wasn't going to create that. Okay? But that was because life, that life in her life, wanted to create and do something else. Because life was always doing something. It can't do everything. So I predicted, yeah, your life is saying it's going to have an abortion. That made her feel okay that that's, yes, who she was. She was a person who was born to have an abortion. That's just what she was. No suppression. Her suppressing herself because she was born to have an abortion. How do we know she was born to have an abortion? Because she had an abortion. That's why we know. Okay? And it was in her chart. So by me proving to her that she was born to have an abortion, by telling her within the first five minutes of the reading that, oh, it looks like you had abortion two years ago. Like, not just you had an abortion, but you had abortion, you know, last spring or something, whatever I said. The minute she realized that that's the life she was, that that was the unsuppressed version of her, she started healing. And when she left, she walked out like a normal person, and she had a rosier complexion, the blood was already flowing, the circulation was getting moving, when she came in cramped and tied off. Okay. So, releasing life in others starts the healing process. Releasing life is just letting the person be what they are. And if that means they are something evil, like somebody who was born to have an abortion, you let them be that. And you don't even let them be it, you prove that they're supposed to be that in the chart. Or if they've been suppressed and so they're scared to do something they really want to do, like they don't have the confidence to maybe do art or play music or do public speaking, and you say, wow, you were born to do art. That's all of a sudden, all the suppression that they got as a kid, that you know, don't do art, it's a waste of time, why do you want to waste your life doing art? And that one statement of, wow, your chart is born to do art. All of a sudden, life is released. Okay? So when we do readings with people, we release life and we heal people without even realizing it. That's what we do with people. Okay? So, suppressing life or releasing life in others. What do we wish to do? Okay? The more problems our Rahu and Ketu are causing, the more suppressing, in, uh, more of our life has been suppressed by others, and the more we, life we will suppress in others usually. Okay? Or the better Rahu and Ketu are in our chart, 
the more life has been released in ourselves and the more um, we will release life in other people. Okay? Then, so number four, suppressing life in oneself finalizes disease. Okay, so suppressing life in others starts the disease process. It just starts it. It kind of just pushes you onto that path. Okay? Releasing life in others puts them on the path of healing. All right? just to, it just gets them to the start of the road. It says, okay, this is the path. You want to take it. This is the path to disease because I've suppressed your life. Or this is the path to healing because I've freed life in you. Or I've released life in you. Then, suppressing life in oneself is what finalizes the disease. It's when you suppress it in yourself. It's when the person puts you on the path and says, you're an idiot, and puts you on that path. And you go, you're right, I'm an idiot. And you, then you're walking down the path. But until you say, yeah, you're right, to that negative force in your life, the disease is not finalized. Okay? So no one can finalize disease but yourself. All right? You're the one who finalizes it. It's your problem. It's not the problem of people pushing you around in the world. In the world, it's a push and shove game. There's always somebody pushing, always somebody who thinks they knows better. It's all about suppressing life. Look at the animal kingdom. Everything is suppressing life by trying to eat everything else. Okay? But in the end, only when we suppress life in ourselves are we actually diseased. So the whole world can say you're the biggest idiot on earth and give you thousands of reasons to have no confidence. But if you yourself don't buy into that, if you don't suppress it, if you don't suppress your own ability to do, you'll never be diseased no matter what's happening around you. Okay? Whereas, if you're decided to suppress the life inside of you, the smallest thing can be the excuse to do that. The smallest word of criticism, constructive criticism from the teacher who thinks you have potential, can make you feel like the biggest loser who gives up right then and there for the rest of your life. So, all, it's all about ourself. It doesn't matter what's happening out there. Suppressing life in oneself finalizes disease, while releasing life in oneself heals. So. We can be put on the healing process path by someone, by someone releasing life in us. That starts the healing process. But it's only when we release life in ourselves and we let the life flow and we let ourselves really be what we are. And then, only then will we be able to heal. Okay? So this is how disease happens. And the biggest indicators of where we're suppressing life, where life is suppressed in our personal life, is Rahu and Ketu. Okay? And once that life gets suppressed, the, the weaker plants in the chart cave in and give the symptoms of disease. But the disease itself is that suppression, which is indicated by Rahu and Ketu, which makes disease very simple. We don't have to study every little planetary commutation. Those are just the symptoms of disease. So, for instance, I can get a person who's been abused to the point of having a low self-esteem. As a result of that strain on him, the person can, can get a thousand different diseases. He can get heart disease, he can go blind, he can get a backache, he can get knee pains, you know, he can get high blood pressure, he can get low blood pressure. He can get every disease in the book, pretty much. And that's such a complex realm. All the tangible diseases we can suffer from, this disease, that disease, this kind of cancer, this kind of bullshit, it's complex. Predicting that is complex because you're trying to predict one thing out of a possibility of thousands of things that can concretely go wrong with your body. And being able to predict that thing doesn't do anyone any good because that's not the disease. That's just the symptom of disease. That's indicated by the planet who breaks down first because he's the weakest planet. Okay? Or the most afflicted planet, which means he has the most strain on him. But that's not the disease. The disease is on a deeper level. The disease is the suppression of life that wants to nourish and feed and keep every planet healthy and alive and robust, but it can't because that life is suppressed and that's the disease. So this makes healing with astrology easy. Okay? 
We just have to learn Rahu and Ketu. We just have to explain Rahu and Ketu. We have to get them on that path of Rahu and Ketu. Once they've started on that path, things can start healing. Okay? Point number five. Suppression of life is to hide life. You know, life wants to create and expand, right? It wants, it wants to flow. Suppression is hiding all that. Okay? And life can be hidden in different ways. There's two ways. When we think of suppression of life, we really think of somebody hiding, right? But let's think the person who's sort of just a, a normal person. Their life is, I'm not going to do anything great. You know, I'm not going to do anything unusual. That's the life that I am. That's, that's what I am. So therefore, that's what I should be. Okay? But, they always have to act important. You know, they're compensating for that fact. That's not good enough for them, so they hide what they are behind the compensation. So, suppression of life is to hide life, also means to hide it by compensating for it. So, everyone meets people in a heavy state of compensation, where they're constantly acting like something they're not. Something better, something stronger, something prettier, something smarter, whatever. Okay. That's also hiding life. Life is what's natural. Life, like Krishna says, follow your swadharma. Your own nature. Follow the life that's flowing through you. That is you. Okay? You need to do that first. If you don't follow your swadharma, your own nature, you can't find God. Because you're not living. You're suppressing them. He goes, doing your own dharma imperfectly is better than doing the dharma of another perfectly. So compensating, doing something great, instead of doing what you are, mediocrely, gets you into more trouble. And that's compensation. Because that hides the life that you are. And that's not healthy. Now, how does life become suppressed? Life is suppressed because of an idea. It's simply suppressed because of an idea. You have an idea to do something, a more powerful force has an idea against that, and you believe that idea. And all of a sudden, your life is suppressed. Or you create another idea in your head. We always are creating ideas in our heads that suppress life. The ideas that suppress life are K2. Okay? Thus, K2 hides, though very craftily. And we'll talk a lot about how crafty K2 can be in hiding life. So, K2 are the ideas we hold on to that suppress life in its entirety and only let some of it leak through. Imagine taking a big piece of clay, right? And that clay, you could take that clay and you could mold it into something. That's your life. You've got this handful of molding clay. You can mold that into something. But instead, you took it and you just grabbed it in a fist. You just smushed it. Well, what happened is, in that suppression, that smushing of that life clay, the clay would kind of goop out of your fingers, right? And at the end, you would have a handful of clay that was never seen, and a whole bunch of clay lumps coming out from all your finger joints that would be nothing to be proud about. So you'd be sitting there, I'm going to mold my life with my clay. Instead of molding a beautiful thing, you just go like this, suppress it, and you get these gloops and globs of ugliness. And inside, you have a lot of clay that was never even revealed or shown. That's suppression of life. That is K2. And that's why... There comes a point in your life where you look back at your life. It's the midlife crisis time, 42 to 48, when Rahu and K2 mature. That we realize, holy shit, my life didn't turn out anything like I wanted it to be. Here I thought I was going to mold my life into a beautiful experience. And what I've done is suppressed it into a glob and with partly it unseen. That's the midlife crisis right there. At that point, it's about unclenching the fist, taking the clay, remolding it into what we really want, or failing that, going into a deeper and deeper disease state. Okay? We will be talking a lot about those maturation ages. 42 to 48 is the maturation age of Rahu and Ketu. In between that is 45. The number, if people die young, the number one age they die is 45. Suicide rate, 45 is a peak time. 42 to 48, 
all that whole period though is a time of death suicides or death from um, diseases prematurely. 42 to 48 is the most common time for people to die young. And also to suicide young, with 45 being the peak. Okay? Because the 45 is right between the Rahu and K2 maturation. It's a critical time. All those are critical times. 42, 45, 48. If you've had those years, you know. If you're young and lucky, I'm glad you're taking this course. Maybe those years can become better. All right. Okay, so the ideas that suppress life are K2. Thus, K2 hides, though very craftily. The minute you suppress something, you hide something. The minute you hide something that you are behind a bigger, better picture, you're also hiding it and suppressing it, right? So, whether hiding by showing a big, amazing picture or hiding by cringing, it's hiding, okay? Once something is hidden, it can be found. That's the problem with hidden things, right? Okay? If you just, you know, put your money in your wallet, you know, and go around, you don't think about, oh, my, someone might find my money, right? The minute you take your money and you hide 20 grand under the mattress, then you go out and you go, God, I hope that we find some money. So, the minute you hide something, you develop a fear of it being hidden, found, right? So that's the problem with hiding something. Once something is hidden, it can be found. And so that which is hidden becomes vulnerable. It becomes a weak point in your life. Oh, they might find that money. I become vulnerable now because I hid something, right? Same in ourselves. If we're hiding a weakness by compensating, now there's a vulnerability. Ooh, what if all my friends who like me find out that I'm really, that's not really me? Ooh, I can't, I, that ought to be horrible if they find that out. I'm vulnerable now, right? So now that I'm vulnerable, I have to become defensive. And now I'm defensive, no one wants to be around me. Now no one wants to be around me, I'm lonely, right? See how fast we ruin our life? Or now that I get defensive, I can't deal with my coworkers well. And so now I'm fired and I don't have a job. And I can't find a job because I go to the interview and I'm defensive at the interview too. It snowballs, okay? So it's no good to hide things. Because then we develop a vulnerability. Once life becomes suppressed, there is vulnerability on an emotional level. So we suppress life on an ideational level. We hold an idea about ourselves. And sometimes this idea is so buried so deep, we're not even aware it's there. It can be that deep in our DNA, in our past life experiences. It is that deep. That's why it takes 48 years to figure it out. By the time Rahu and Ketu matures, you should have a good grip on it. So, once life becomes suppressed, there is vulnerability on an emotional level. This is Rahu, the opposite point from K2. Okay? That's your vulnerable point, Rahu now. Why is that vulnerable? Because it's the opposite point. Okay? So, if I hide something under the ground, so you can't see it from the top, which is K2. K2 says, okay, I'm going to hide this, it can't be seen. From this direction, it can't be seen. But from the ground up, it'll be found. From the opposite vantage point is where we find something. So let's say you hide in the woods because you're scared of getting you know, shot by some enemies during a war. So you hide behind a tree in the woods. So they're over here, and the tree's here, and you're hiding behind the tree. Alright, you're hid, right? But the opposite point, that's where you're vulnerable, right? Because from the opposite point, they're going to see you. That's Rahu. Okay? So, the opposite vantage point is the point of vulnerability. Because that's where the secrets are discovered. That's where whatever is hidden is going to be visible. So, with K2 we hide things from ourselves first, from other people second, and the whole world eventually. And when we get involved in the houses of Rahu, that's when we realize what we're hiding. So that's why the house of Rahu gives us so much grief, because it's a constant painful reminder of what it is that we're really hiding. Okay? Because that's the opposite vantage point. And only from the opposing vantage points can something that is hidden be found. Okay? Number eight. Disease can be healed by having the courage to face emotional vulnerabilities and the compassion to accept life and through that, to overcome ideas. 
So courage and compassion, those are the secrets to healing Rahu and Ketu. We have to have compassion towards the Ketu parts of our life and courage for the Rahu parts of our life, okay? Without that, there's no hope, okay? There are also those, number nine, there are also those things that appear like disease, but which are not disease. These things are Saturn, which aggravate the body. If I go eat 20 liters of ice cream, I'm going to get sick tomorrow, you know? If I go, you know, if, you know, if I um, go outside when it's 10 degrees out and spend the next 20 hours out there naked, I am going to have a disease, right? My body is not going to handle that. If I'm going to eat arsenic, I'm going to get a disease, right? So there's things out there that aggravate the body that are not good for the body. Okay, they harm it. They just physically, chemically, um, physiologically, biologically harm the body. Okay, those are not disease. Those are aggravations. Disease, what's the difference between disease and an aggravation? In the context of this course, of my system of health and healing, the difference is disease is something that comes from within. Aggravations are just things that happen from without because of chemical and biological laws. Okay? So, no big deal. So if I went outside at 10 degree weather naked and spent 20 hours out there, I would be diseased. But as soon as I got warmed up and my body regained its vital heat, and I rejuvenated from that by a little bit of rest, I'd be fine. No big deal, right? I wouldn't have a disease. Okay? That's simply an aggravation, that as soon as you remove the aggravating thing and supply the biological need, the disease is overcome. But it's not a disease, the aggravation is overcome. Okay? That doesn't matter, that's easy to heal. Those are the diseases that are easy to heal. You go to the doctor, the acupuncturist, the dietitian, the nutritionist, the this, the that, or the that. They'll heal that easy. Those are the ones that heal in five minutes. Okay, you're done, one treatment, you're fit. Okay? Because they're just aggravations. That's like saying, oh, I'm so cold, I'm so cold, I've been outside for 20 hours in the cold, and somebody throws you a blanket and says, here's your magic pill. And you wrap yourself up in the blanket, and an hour later you go, oh, I feel, I feel good, you saved me. That's what most medicine is like. The medicine that works regularly is working on that level. But then, disease is something where people go to this doctor, this therapist, this doctor, this specialist, this natural healer, this, you know, specialist, around and round and round and round and round, and they don't get well. That's the disease that we're talking about. Why is that disease so difficult to treat? Because that's starting on the inside. It has nothing to do with an aggravation. Got it? So, problems caused by aggravations are cured with the right remedy instantly. Okay? Problems caused by interior diseases, real diseases, whether they're emotionally centered problems, or emotionally centered disease, physical centered disease, energetic centered disease, or mentally centered diseases, those are not going to be cured and healed until there's a, a huge shift within the individual. Only a few active healing modalities can trigger that shift, and they only can trigger it to a real huge healing level if the person is also working within themselves. Okay? So, as astrologers, we want to help the person work that within themselves by helping them understand their Rahu and Ketu and reduce the suppression of life and allowing life to let them live and mentally, emotionally, physically, and energetically as a happy being. Okay? So, number 10. The body... Okay. Number 9, I want to make sure I finish that. There are also those things that appear like disease, but which are not disease. These things are Saturn, which aggravates the body. These things must exist because one day it's important for the body to die. The body one day needs an excuse to die. Therefore, we need aggravations that can kill the body. The body can be aggravated, but that does not mean the organism is diseased. Disease limits mental and emotional freedom. It is quite possible to have the body aggravated while maintaining mental and emotional freedom. Okay? 
It is the number 11. It is the healing of disease which is important. Healing of aggravations is not important as they pass as necessary. They're just going to come and go. They'll leave eventually. Unless you keep doing the disease thing, you keep eating the arsenic, you keep staying out in the cold, whatever. Then yes, they won't heal. But as soon as you stop it, you'll catch up. Okay? So, healing of aggravation is not important as they pass as necessary, or they cause a person to pass as necessary. Meaning, if they're excused for the body to be dropped when the soul has finished its so this sojourn on earth. Number 12. The strain experienced by the organism on account of Rahu and Ketu deteriorates the healthy functioning of the mental, emotional, energetic, and physical bodies as represented by the seven embodied Rahas. Okay? So, healing Rahu and Ketu means healing the whole person and getting them on the road to healing the whole person. Okay? Um, and so it's very, very important, it's very, very profound. Over the last year and a half, 99% of my consultations have been strictly dealing in the realm of disease. Mental, emotional, physical, um, you know, every, all types of diseases. If, they, if, you're, if you weren't admitting to being sick, you didn't get to see me the last year and a half. You had to say, I'm emotionally screwed up, I'm mentally screwed up, I'm physically screwed up. You had to say one of those things to even get a consult with me. Um, to not have me hit the delete button, pretty much. Um, and as a result of all that, um, I've learned a tremendous amount about Rahu and Ketu. And, um, and you, know, I've all, you know, Rahu and Ketu as an astrologer is something you're going to learn about every year of your life. You're always going to learn. But the last year and a half, my learning has been expo exponential um, on Rahu and Ketu. Also because of my K2 maturation, which was really um, an insane ride in every way. Uh, they say Rahu's the roller coaster, meaning it can just give ups and then give downs. For me, a Rahu maturation really wasn't such a roller coaster, but K2 maturation, because I have it in the first house and its rulers in the eighth house, whoa, talk about insane stuff, you know, from the top bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountains. In many, in all areas of life, it's been an insane ride that I'm not going to bore anyone with the details. But um, it gave these de these events, experiences, whatever, gave me a great understanding of K2 and Rahu that I didn't possess before. I always felt I knew a lot about them, of course, otherwise I wouldn't have taught on them. But I've learned a tremendous amount, especially in the context of health and disease, and while people are really coming. If a person just comes because they say, oh, I want to know I'm going to get married, you know, so what? You know, that's, that has nothing to do with your happiness. It's being diseased and trying to become free of disease that um, improves our happiness, okay? Predicting that, yes, you're going to get married in six months, but if you're a diseased individual that gets married in six months, you're going to muck up your marriage. So what's the point of predicting something you're going to go muck up? So I quit spending time doing that last year and a half and just try to deal with seeing how we can heal better with astrology. Um, there's two ways I've come about it. One way is through what well, we're going to learn in this Rahu and Ketu course. Okay? We're going to learn it in respect to Rashis and Houses, and then we're going to learn it in respect to Nakshatras. So Rahu and Ketu are each doing three things. And with Houses, the three things, that, you know, there's Houses have different qualities. Signs have different qualities. Nakshatras have different qualities. So Rahu and Ketu are suppressing life and causing us to have vulnerabilities in many, many ways, not just three ways. Not like there's one thing the Nakshatra does. There's ten things the Nakshatra does, ten things the Rashi does, five things the Houses does. And we're dealing with dozens of effects of your specific Rahu and Ketu um, placement. The Ketu in the Rashi, Rahu and Ketu position, the Rashi chart, critical. Position of the Dwadasamsha chart, super critical. And position the D60, extremely critical too. So then we have to deal with them in three Vargas too. So by the time you really study them all the way to the end, you see how they are really impacting you, you know, greatly and in the most important ways imaginable. Um, one of the important things about Rahu and Ketu is that they indicate the parental themes in our life. Okay, the, sorry, the ancestral themes. Rahu and Ketu are ancestors. So 
So our great-great-grandparents raised our great-parents in a certain way, which caused our great-grandparents to raise our grandparents in a certain way, which caused them to raise our parents in a certain way, which caused them to treat us like a certain way, right? And this goes back several generations. And Rather than Kate to represents that. So this ancestral imprint you have, because of how your parents were raised by their parents and so on, that's your karmic stamp. That's your Rahu and Ketu. And that is your, that is your DNA. That's the programming in your DNA. Okay? The DNA itself, as a molecule, is Venus. Okay? But the programming in that DNA is Rahu and Ketu. All right? And that's that ancestral programming which is also your karmic programming. So you're born to a family whose ancestral experiences mirror your karmic experiences. So if you see someone with a K2 Saturn conjunction and you talk to them about what that means in their life and in their past lives, you can say, and you had an ancestor who, who, who ex had these experiences. And they'll say, yeah, my great grandfather lived just like that. You know, if they know about their ancestors. They, a lot of people these days sadly don't know about their family tree very much. But if they know the stories of their great-grandfather and, and relatives going back seven generations, they'll be able to relate an ancestral experience to their own karmic experiences, which are manifesting as their problems in this lifetime. So that ancestral stamp of the DNA, which is Rahu and Ketu, is the same as the... Um, the karmic stamp of our past lives. So we can call it one or the other. As a medical, as a medical scientist, we'd want to call it the DNA. As a Hindu, we would want to call it past lives, depending on what, how you want to explain it, but they're the same thing. There's no difference. Science and religion are the same when they're practiced truthfully. Okay? Um, so when we're dealing with these Rahu and Ketus, we're literally looking at your ancestral um, the effects of your ancestors upon your life, the effects of your past lives on your life, and what that means and how that's limited you, and how that caused you fears and vulnerabilities that have to be worked through in this lifetime. So I hope this gives an idea that what we're going to learn in this class. And I've already taught a lot of really good points that you can, you can continue to think on and improve upon your Rahu and K2 practice. Uh, but we're going to get into great detail. We're going to cover we're not going to cover, like in the past, I said, okay, Rahu and Taurus is like this, Rahu and Scorpio is like this, not that kind of stuff. We're going to get into it on a much more specific and fine level than that, where we'll talk about Rahu and the Earth signs, Rahu and Water signs, Rahu and Movable signs, Rahu and Male signs, Rahu and Female signs, you know, all the different qualities of the signs. I just did a course um, in preview of this called um, the New Rashi Sutras should take that course first. Don't take this Rahu and Ketu course until you went through the Rashi Sutras course, the new Rashi Sutras course. Because everything we learned in that course, we're now going to be taken through with respect to Rahu and Ketu in those placements. Okay? After we get that done, we're going to deal with Rahu and Ketu in the houses. That'll be a little less um, encompassing. You know, won't be as many courses, videos for that, but it'll be substantial. After that's done, I'm going to teach a new class on nakshatras, where I'm going to talk about all the different things that we're going to use in the next, in the second Rahu and K2 course, where we deal with nakshatras. And by then, you should have a big vision of what's happening with um, your Rahu and K2s and the Rahu and K2s of your clients. Now, one last thing before I go here, as I mentioned. The Lagna, the nodes of the Lagna and Seventh move forwards. They travel through the Zodiac in regular order, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, and so on. Okay? The um, Rahu and Kate, and so do the houses. So, so do the Zodiac signs. They're like fixed, which means forward. Rahu and Kate to move reverse through the Zodiac signs. And Nakshatras also move reverse. Due to the procession of the equinoxes, the Nakshatras are actually moving in a reverse motion through the zodiac. Okay? And so, we have two forces of motion in the sky, actually. Okay? We've got the motion of the planets 
going through the zodiac and the houses going through the zodiac in their normal order, the sun going through the zodiac forward, and the ascendant going forward. They always only move forward, the sun and the ascendant. And of course the sun creates the sun signs. That's why I say the zodiac signs are moving forward, because that's the motion of the sun. Rahu and Ketu are moving in reverse. Okay? And the due to the precession of the equinoxes, the um, nakshatras are also moving in reverse. And that's why Rahu and Ketu are strongly related to nakshatras by having rulership over nakshatras, whereas the Rahu and Ketu do not rule zodiac signs, and therefore they do not rule houses either. They just rule nakshatras. Okay? And that's very important as you're going to learn. So, with respect to the sun creating the concrete reality in the houses, the sun signs, you know, the signs of the zodiac and the houses moving in a forwards direction, they're creating the concrete reality. Then the reverse direction is the nodes of the moon and the chakras. That's our response and reactions to the concrete reality and how we grow from it, how we act upon it. Okay? And so that's, it's a completely different thing that's happening. We have a concrete reality and we're experiencing a concrete reality. Those things are not lined up. Those are not the same thing. And the reason that's shown in astrology in that Rahu and Ketu and the Kshatras are going in the reverse direction of the sun and the houses. Okay? So you can dwell on that a little bit, but you'll see insights from that as we continue with the course. Okay, thank you.